Uh, so, meandering around YouTube the other day, I came across an older video by Inspiring Philosophy. If you don't know who he is, he does a lot of debates. Um, you can see him debate Matt Dillahunty, as well as Scholar Fiction, um, Galvis Engineer, I believe. And generally speaking, he is a fairly intelligent individual. However, he often tends to misrepresent scientific evidence to fit his ideas regardless of what the facts may say. I'm not necessarily sure if this is intentional or unintentional, but more often than not, when he makes videos regarding certain topics, particularly emergence theory or quantum mechanics, it's very clear that he is trying to conform the information to his presuppositions rather than presenting the information honestly and allowing the conclusions to lead where they may. And the video that I'll be addressing today is certainly no exception. So let's take a look, shall we? Materialism was the view of many scientists at the turn of the 20th century. This simplistic view that all that existed was matter and energy, and the rearrangements of it, is the extreme view of realism. Realism is a general belief accepted by many today, that a physical reality exists independent of observation. And roughly 100 years ago, most held to one of these two views, rejecting the opposing view, idealism, the view that reality is a mental construct and doesn't exist independent of observation. For many back then, their understanding of physics seemed to favor this side of the spectrum, firmly believing it buried idealism. However, this realistic worldview was shaken with the advent of quantum mechanics. Okay, so first and foremost, I need to point this out. You don't know what the general philosophy is of any particular scientist unless they happen to make some sort of an announcement or proclamation of that. You're making assumptions and assertions about the metaphysics of scientists without any particular evidence as to what their actual philosophical viewpoint is. Science relies on methodological realism, naturalism, and materialism. As soon as you can provide something outside of these realms that science can actually approach, then great, they'll begin to study that. If you want us to move away from this sort of an approach, you have to present something, anything, that we can actually test that would demonstrate your approach from idealism. Because until you do, scientists can only work with what they've got. And what they've got is the natural world, is matter. Until you can show us something outside of the material, natural world for us to be able to utilize and test, we have no use for it. That's not to say that you can't approach your metaphysics from an idealist perspective, but that's entirely different from the methodological approach that science requires us to take. ...of how the quantum world behaved began to eat away at the materialist and realist beliefs. Matter was thought to be tiny particles that existed independent of our observation. However, the equations of quantum mechanics and the results of the double slit experiment changed that. Okay, <laughs> so I'm gonna keep this running in the background uh, as I explain the remainder of this just because I can't believe he actually used this, but uh, the footage here describing the double slit experiment came from one of the two What the Bleep Do We Know movies, which, if you're unaware of, are absolute utter horseshit. Uh, I can't think of a simpler way to explain it. It's god awful crack pottery, the likes of which you only see from the craziest of woo peddlers. So, yeah, that's where he's getting his animation for the double slit experiment from. Just FYI. Okay, so a few things that I need to break down here specifically. Yes, once we developed the theory of quantum mechanics and um, some of the equations relating to that, the need for what's known as an observer is absolutely necessary for the collapse of any given wave function. In the video, IP goes on to try and show this through another video describing the double slit experiment. Link below will be a video from uh, Veritasium that I believe uh, better demonstrates the double slit experiment and actually shows it actively being produced. To oversimplify the bizarre nature of quantum mechanics, matter at its smallest components is neither 
a particle nor a wave. It's essentially both until some observing effect comes into play with that matter, which causes it to collapse down into a specific point. In other words, matter is neither a particle nor a wave, but acts as both at the same time. Now, granted, this is a very broad, oversimplified view of how the wave function collapses and the nature of matter on a quantum level, but for the sake of this video, that's a clear enough description to understand where the major problem is with Inspiring Philosophy's approach to this subject. The fact is, is that yes, wave functions only collapse as a result of an observing principle, known as the observer effect. But the observer effect does not have to be us or any other form of consciousness. Below here I'll link to an example from what's known as the Wiseman experiment from 1998, where the same type of experiment was conducted, and the so-called observing principle for this was simply a machine measuring the particles. There were no observers involved. Therefore, consciousness is not at all a necessary component of the collapse of any wave function. At that time, though, not everyone liked the conclusion that was playing out. Some, like Einstein and Schrodinger, were deeply troubled by the results of quantum mechanics. So in 1935, Einstein and two of his colleagues proposed a thought experiment to debunk quantum mechanics. They proposed that if you placed two particles in a joint superposition and then separated them by a great distance, an observation of one would instantly affect the other, which Einstein called a spooky action at a distance. The point was the observation of one couldn't affect the other instantly, because information couldn't travel faster than the speed of light. If it did, then relativity would be violated, which didn't seem possible at the time. So instead, there must be some physical, undiscovered, local, hidden variable that was actually affecting them instead of our observation. That matter acted independent of observation and only appeared to be observer-dependent from our perspective. However, in the 1960s, John Bell began to explore this thought experiment and propose an inequality. If this inequality was shown to be false, then the local hidden variable theories would be debunked and matter would be dependent on observation. This was put to experimental test in 1982 by the physicist Alan Aspect, and the results confirmed Bell's prediction. Bell's inequality was violated. Einstein's spooky action at a distance was real. This confirmed what quantum mechanics was telling us. Prior to measurement, objects have no defined properties or location. The act of a conscious observer creates the existence of the physical objects and the properties they entail. And there you go with that tricky little addition again. A conscious observer? No. I mean, first off, please define for me what you mean by conscious, but if you mean conscious in the sense that we're conscious, or in the sense that any type of living organism might be conscious, and that's somehow required for the collapse of a wave function, wrong. I mean, that's an outright falsehood. Now, more specifically onto Bell's inequality and a few of the other factors that you tried to touch on here, Yes, we have discovered that local hidden variables are more than likely not there. However, workarounds to different factors of local hidden variables include quantum tunneling, many worlds theory, and pilot wave theory, all of which have their own unique drawbacks. But to say that it's something that is clearly determined or that we have a very straightforward answer to is far from the actual case. However, in 2007, they were also falsified, this time by Anton Zellinger and his team. The results sent shockwaves, and physics world went so far as to say this means quantum physics says goodbye to reality. So recent experiments led by a group at the University of Vienna, Austria, provide the most compelling evidence yet that there is no objective reality beyond what we observe. So it's really the observation that creates the reality. And what they found is that Leggett's inequality is violated as well as Bell's. Even if you allow for instantaneous influences, Quantum measurements do not fit with the idea of an objective reality. So as they say in the magazine, rather than passively observing it, we in fact create reality. A reality independent of observation doesn't exist. Really listening to some of this stuff makes me think of Deepak Chopra or someone along those lines. Now, ironically enough, the Zellinger experiments that you refer to right here were also, if I'm not mistaken, mentioned quite a bit inside of that god-awful movie what the bleep do we know where they tried to show that depending on how you 
think about the world and what happy thoughts are inside of your head, you might be able to change the nature of reality around you. Now, I understand that woo is rather popular among many new age quote unquote thinkers, but it's, it's not what the Zellinger experiments were actually demonstrating. What those, in fact, were showing is that the quantum erasure experiment functionally can occur at distances well beyond what light can travel in under the time of the experiment. However, making this assertion that we create the reality that we see around us is a pretty drastic exaggeration, to say the very least. Not to mention that it discounts the possibility of determinism, or the many worlds theory, or any other number of possible explanations for the results that we're seeing, and simply places this one as being somehow the most probable, even though it's still incredibly unlikely, to say the least. Now, if one wishes to just dismiss all of this, I can simply refer you to the Quantum Randy Challenge, where you can win a Nobel Prize and prove naive realism, or local realism is true, and not observation dependent. Until then, to just dismiss all this science pointing in the opposite direction is nothing more than a faith-based opinion. Now, when it comes to the Quantum Randy Challenge, we do have potential explanations that move outside that answer these questions of local hidden variables. Like I described before, the many worlds theory, pilot wave theory are both very good examples of potential answers to this question. But to try and proclaim that viewing different possibilities as answers to these questions is somehow dismissing the evidence and providing nothing more than a faith-based opinion, I again have to point back to the original issue of, well, what's your opinion then with idealism? It's presenting something that nobody has any evidence of. There seems to be no concrete potential for it to exist and you cannot demonstrate the necessity of it in any way, shape, or form. Because again, the observing principle doesn't necessarily have to be conscious. Another escape route many materialists use is to hold to the many world interpretations of quantum mechanics, which basically argues there is no collapse of the wave function upon measurement, but that every possibility splits off into different worlds. So every quantum probability actually does play out. They just split off into different worlds and in each one I'm observing each different outcome. But it is riddled with problems, unlike the idealist understanding, and it is an apparent violation of Occam's razor, as entities are not to be multiplied beyond necessity. Introducing a large number of worlds that we also cannot detect is an extreme violation of this, especially since this can be explained by accepting all these possibilities just exist in a mathematical probability as a wave function, instead of as actual worlds that can never be verified or falsified. An idealist understanding can explain this just fine with much less and other aspects of reality that we dealt with in our last video. So the problem here is that idealism doesn't have any more explanatory power than a many worlds interpretation or any other possible interpretation for the outcomes that we see in quantum mechanics. This idea that somehow a supernatural mind or consciousness outside of the reality that we understand manifests the reality in which we exist is somehow more reasonable or less absurd than saying that wave functions in fact do not collapse and instead manifest themselves in a multitude of different realities or that all of these wave functions are already determined in a deterministic universe, that these are somehow less reasonable? How so? And again, I need to get back to the original point with all this, and that is the fact that right now we understand that the math and the physics behind quantum mechanics does in fact work. These expositions asserting what the metaphysics is supposed to be surrounding this field of physics is again trying to take a certain presupposition and insert it into the data and force it to fit going far beyond what the actual science is able to demonstrate thus far and asserting many many other factors that we have no evidence of so until you actually have evidence of either a consciousness outside of a mind 
or brain or consciousness outside of reality, then that's just one massive arbitrary insertion of something that we have no evidence for. I mean, I'm sure that you're not necessarily a huge fan of the guy, but you genuinely sound a lot like Deepak Chopra. You've taken these kernels of truth inside of quantum mechanics and made enormous extrapolations into realms that you have no business making assertions in and claiming that they're based upon this scientific evidence when the fact is that it's not. So I don't know. Good luck. I'm sure I'll be looking at more of your videos. I see that you've done some more recent stuff with regards to emergence theory and a number of other interesting topics, trying to assert that they demonstrate the necessity for there to be some sort of a god. Those should be fun to be able to look at. But if this is any indication of what I'm going to be looking forward to, I'm going to take a wild guess and say that it'll be more of the same. That you'll start with a presupposition and then find ways to be able to conform the evidence to fit that presupposition, regardless of whether or not it actually does. So, thank you all for listening. This has been Aaron with Godless Recovery. I appreciate the time, and I'll see you all the next time around.